Uber is being rumored to be taking it, but I'm guessing we're not expecting that. That wasn't, uh, yeah, that rumor was debunked pretty okay. quickly. Um, there's a lot of complexities for, but the sharing economy, quite interestingly, is a great opportunity for, for Bitcoin. You expect that to take off before the retail does, right? Yes. Okay. But more important, actually, the, the thing I expect to take off first in Bitcoin is uh, very cumbersome cross-border transactions. And there are three categories of that. The first one is companies that need to pay suppliers, subcontractors, and partners all across the world. Uh, Google has 20,000 affiliates they need to pay every month. Um, many companies have outsourcing partners, uh, sales partners all over the world. Uh, travel and hospitality companies, airlines, etc., etc., parts companies, automotive companies, uh, and these cross-border transactions are horribly expensive, very slow, extremely cumbersome. They have huge overheads and friction. The second one is basic import-export. If you're doing transnational trade, then using a transnational currency actually makes a lot of sense. Um, there are disadvantages with the dollar. There are disadvantages with traditional wire transfers that Bitcoin solves. Um, so it's practical. And then the really interesting one for me is foreign remittances. Uh, there are maybe a hundred million people who are working as immigrants in developed countries, and they send 560 billion dollars home every year through companies like Western Union and MoneyGram and things like that. And for that, they pay nine percent as the average fee, netting Western Union a really handsome profit. It's uh, yeah, shocking. That's it's absolutely margins. shocking, and a lot of that has to do with political constraints more than anything else. Um, but that is an area where Bitcoin can not only have an immediate technological impact, but that impact translates into um, an enormous source of income for some of the poorest people in the world. Now, if you to put that into perspective, the 175 billion dollars that goes to fees in the international remittances market is larger than the entire foreign aid budget of all of the world governments put together. So, and you would instead of putting this in the hands of governments and trickling it down, you give it directly to the poorest people. In fact, you give it directly to women in the poorest countries because they're usually the recipients of remittances, and they will take every single dollar and create five dollars of investment in clean water, sanitation, healthcare, education, food, which has an enormous leveraged impact on poverty. Right. So you sent this, me some statistics on banking. You said more than two and a half billion people have no access to banking services. Four billion have extremely limited banking services. Probably, like you mentioned, only one and a half billion people enjoy the kind of international banking that you and I do. Yes. What that means is that I can open a brokerage account in 24 hours, and 24 hours later, I can be trading on the Tokyo Stock Exchange in yen that I use dollars to buy on equities. I could even get a loan from a Japanese bank, or then I could be trading in South Africa. I can repatriate all that money. My government is not going to try to take half of it or kill me for doing this. Um, I can get loans. I can incorporate companies all around the world. I can wire transfer anywhere I want. That is privileged banking. Very few people have that. So what does it mean if you take that capability and you turn it into a capability that can be accessed from a text messaging Nokia 1000 phone? that is in the hands of four billion people, more people that have access to clean water, in the most rural and remote parts of the world, they now have these devices because they give them a landline to the world, they give them uh, a lifeline to the world of communication. What if that phone simultaneously is a banking terminal, a loan origination terminal, a remittance terminal, uh, an international credit terminal, an equity trading terminal, an import-export payment terminal? That has much greater implications for what happens in the world than the enormous impact we've seen of cellular telephony in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, where it's brought communication to the furthest reaches of the world. If you go into some of these rural places, and I'm not speaking out of first-hand experience for most of them, but I have seen it myself in a few places, if you see a solar panel on a hut, that solar panel is not used to cook. It's not used to watch TV. It's used to charge the only cell phone in the village. That's what it's there for. And that one cell phone connects an entire village to the world. Now that cell phone is a bank. And that is why I'm in Bitcoin. Are we getting any closer to that? 
No. To watch the rest of this fascinating interview, click on the link below and go to londonrealacademy.com. There you can sign in with your social media login and watch the rest of the episode for free, along with all of our episodes on London Real, my webinars, and all of our premium content, all located over at londonrealacademy.com. So click on the link below, you'll be directed there and you can watch the rest of this fascinating interview, and I'll see you there.